Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We'll begin our study in just a moment in Colossians chapter 3, verse 20. And, and uh, my intention tonight is for us to get on through here and get into the first verse of uh, chapter 4. So uh, after creating heaven and earth, as you well know, God created Adam and Eve. And the first thing the Heavenly Father said to his children, among the first things the Heavenly Father said to his children was, don't. Don't what, Adam replied. Don't eat the forbidden fruit, God said. Forbidden fruit? We have forbidden fruit. Hey, Eve, we have forbidden fruit. No way. Way. Do not eat the forbidden fruit, said God. Why? Because I'm your father and I said so, God replied. A few minutes later, God saw his children having a fruit break and he was angry. Didn't I tell you not to eat the fruit, God asked. Uh-huh, Adam replied. Then why'd you do it, said the father. I don't know, said Eve. She started it, Adam said. Did not, did too, did not. At this point, God had had enough. To punish Adam and Eve, he decreed that they should have children of their own. And, that's <laughs> what this. and things have never changed. <laughs> I thought y'all might uh, enjoy that. Oh. I love these words of um, of Warren Wearsby. Um, Warren Wearsby says this: uh, "Children don't create children don't create problems; they reveal for problems." Mm -hmm. And um, I think there might be a lot of truth uh, mm -hmm. in in those words. So. Um, Let's get back up here. All right, what did I do wrong? Oh, there we go. All right, so in a Colossians chapter 3, verse 20, Paul says this, and, and you know, similar words are found to these in, in Ephesians chapter 6, the first three or four verses. Uh, Paul says, through inspiration of the Spirit, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Verse 21 says, Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. All right, we have a screen full of uh, parents and grandparents tonight, so um, I look forward to, uh, to hearing from you about uh, these two verses. All right, uh, obvious question first. From here we build our foundation. The child's job is what? Obey, parents. obey their parents. Obey the parents. All right, obeying their parents, obedience. That is the child's uh, responsibility in the parent-child relationship, to obey their parents. All right, so how do children learn obedience? How or from where? Parents. parents. From the parents. From the parents. Pretty much, pretty much they learn how to obey from their parents. Uh, from watching us, uh, from watching our consistency or, or lack of saying, whatever the case may be, for the most part, they learn obedience by watching uh, their parents. Now, my question is this, especially since verse 20 says, children, obey your parents in everything. Mm -hmm. um, everything is, is, has no qualifiers to it. There's nothing in the Greek to weaken that word, everything. Children, obey your parents in everything. Um, at what age is this command to obey parents lifted? You I might have had a child who thought never. it was six. Never. <laughs> All right. so we got a never. All right. I, th I honestly think there's some truth to that, Gail. I'm going to tap on that into a minute. <laughs> Um, in, in a little different nuance, but um, all right, we got a never, all right? All right, somebody else, what you got? At what age should your, do your children do not have to obey their parents? Oh. When they become mm -hmm. adults, they still have to be respect. All right, your silence is deafening. Mm-hmm. 
possibly when they move out and they're more responsible for themselves. Mm -hmm. All right. When when they're no longer under your house, uh, no longer under your roof, okay, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, have greater responsibility for themselves, okay. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I think most of us have experienced rather than there being a cutoff, there's more of a transition of um, gradually growing in responsibility, um, a gradual transition into an advise and consent type of role and then a, a time to kind of um, release if you would um, now when a when a gail said never and um there, there would be times that i would that that would definitely make our lives a lot less stressful um there is a very real sense in which while the while the word obey might not necessarily have the same sternness to it, there is a sense in which we continue to um, obey perhaps through honor. Um, there are things that I do in my life now that I know honor my father. Uh, because they were born out of things that originally were obedience. Um, but now at this stage of my life, it's more of an honoring uh, of them. Um, so there is a nuance in there that in a very real sense, parents are always parents. And, and should always, uh, always have that honor and should always have that respect. Um, so since, since most of us, since, since this is more of parents than, than kids on here, of course, we're all somebody's kid. Um, I wanted to spend more time on verse 21 that says, fathers, do not embitter your children. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about that. First question is this, um, why do you think Paul was gender specific here? Um, he says, fathers. And the original word here is a gender specific word. It, it's not a gender neutral word. Um, so it's very, it, obviously he's not absolving moms of any responsibility, but he says, fathers do not embitter your children. Uh, why do you think Paul, Paul did that? I think it's, fathers have the greatest opportunity to alienate their children. And mothers. Okay. And uh, I, I think that uh, uh, because they're out of the house, they're working, not to say that mothers don't work, but um, they're gone a lot and they're not as involved in their children's lives as moms are. And we have a tendency, I'm speaking for myself, to alienate our kids um, because I wasn't as involved in their life as, as looking back on it as I should have been. Okay. And, and sometimes that can lead to, to missing a little bit of context. Um, right. when something's coming up, very good point, Tom. Dan, go ahead, brother. Years ago, I used to umpire little league baseball games. <laughs> I cannot tell you how many times I want to take a dad behind a woodshed. <laughs> yeah, was fun about a thousand to never make an error. Every pitch had to be a strike. I think it was totally frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> you could see the children crying on the mound, you know, their dad yeah. yelling at fans. Uh, fathers tend to want their children to be what they couldn't have been. Perfect. Wow. Uh, that has an extra layer, doesn't it? Uh -huh. Not that we want them to be what we were, what we couldn't be. That's profound. Yes, sir. Uh, Jack, go ahead. 
I think sometimes fathers are kind of saddled with the um, dubious responsibility of, of being the wielder of punishment and okay. things of that sort. I recall very vividly times when my mom was not happy with something that I did. And rather than deal with it herself, she would say, "When well, your dad will take care of that when, we, when he gets home. And, and it puts a sense of fear into, your, into you, waiting on him, not, not exactly knowing what he's going to do. And I think, effect, I think children are affected by that. I think so too, Jack. Good point. Uh, Richard, go ahead. I think there, I think there's a fine line uh, here as well that if a father is going to be the head of his household, he can't be the head of a household as a dictator. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you exasperate your children or embitter them to the point that you lose their respect, that they never have any self-worth, you haven't accomplished your job. I think it's a warning for, for fathers that, uh, you know, you build on the head of the household, but there's a way that a proper head of household operates. I think so too, Richard. Absolutely. Tom McTy, go ahead, brother. I, I believe also that Paul is telling us here that, you know, children are to be, obey their parents. And to do that, they've got to respect them and they've got to trust them that their best interests are at heart and that their father is going to take the lead role as the head of the house and earn that trust and earn that respect, knowing that the children are well taken care of and that their best interests are at heart. They will react to that from the father and from the mother if they have the trust, their respect, and the love for their father. Amen. Amen, Tom. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Dan brought up one of the ways that um, fathers uh, can embitter their children. And by the way, we're again, we're not absolving moms. Moms are capable of, of embittering their children as well. Mm -hmm. um, so um, Dan brought up one specific way that, that can embitter a child is, is ex ex expecting the impossible, uh, setting standards that, that are impossible to to live up to. Um, what are some other ways that a father or a mother for that matter uh, could embitter a child? Not giving any positive reinforcement. Mm. Okay, a lack of positive reinforcement, good, okay. Or not. Cutting them down, acting like they're not good enough. They're not, you know, worthy enough to, to uh, be your child. Absolutely. Okay. But Doing what they tell their children not to do. I'm sorry, Dan, go ahead. I missed it. Doing what they tell their children not to do. Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a biggie. Yeah. Talk about Miss Cindy mixed messages. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that... Um, Parents who do not discipline, who are afraid to correct their child, will also um, turn that child against them. Mm -hmm. Because they're inconsistent. And ch children, I, I really believe that children want consistency. Absolutely. Whether it's O overly over control or, or um, but it's um, when they don't discipline, when they don't, when they overindulge your kids, mm -hmm. they, um, they, they turn them against them too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that, that's not always the first one that comes to mind, but I think that's an excellent point, Tom, of whenever, whenever we give them whatever they want, um, mm -hmm. 
whenever we don't allow them to suffer consequences for their actions, um, we're not doing any favors. And, and we can do more harm than good uh, through those activities of, of just in, especially indulging, absolutely. Uh, Tom McTie, go ahead. Tom, you're on mute, brother. I'm Here. sorry. Uh, I think one of the biggest things we can do as parents or grandparents is to teach our children to, to, to love and the things that they need to love and gear them towards the things that are godly in nature and away from the things that are going to bring them down and bring them away from God. And we do that by example. We do that by suggestion. We do that by being involved with them, whether it be Bible studies, whether it be, you know, classes, you know, in their lives, we have to be involved with them. And if we are part of their lives and we teach them to love the Lord and to rejoice, okay, in the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ, if we teach them these things, they're going to hold on to those things. And it still adds to the respect and the example that we need to set. We talk a lot about discipline. We talk a lot about, you know, the opposite side of needing to encourage, but we also but we need to set an example and realize that you know we can make mistakes and we need to you know continue to work with each other as far as parents especially young parents in doing the things that god would have us to do yes sir yes sir uh jack go ahead brother i also think that uh, parents are often um guilty of setting uh, levels of expectation that are uh, potentially, you know, too great for a child to achieve. And uh, I think that can be a problem. Yeah, I think so too, Jack. Um, I'm, I'm getting an amen from, from somebody in the room right now um, from, from my wife that um, does. <laughs> For sure. For yeah, because sure. there was actually a time with my dad that I um, came home with um, my first semester in college. I had a, I went in with a 1.7 grade point average, and at the end of the semester, I had a 3.4, and he was all over me that um, you were so close to dean's list. You were, you didn't make the dean's oh, list, amen. and I had come up that far. However, so it goes with exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's exactly what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's, um, yeah, Tom and Ty, go ahead. Sorry. You know, we, 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 we talk a lot about, as adults, we talk a lot about, you know, we need to have respect from our children. We need to get their respect. We need to get their love. But oftentimes we forget we need to respect our children. We need mm -hmm. to respect them as individuals yes. and Absolutely. someone that has a soul. They have a heart and a mind and a soul, and we need to respect them as individuals and love them as individuals and as parents. Amen, mm -hmm. Tom. Yes, sir. I'm going to show you a um, uh, something that I shamelessly stole from another preacher named Brian Bill, but... Um, few questions that that can be uh, helpful uh, to ask. Let me pull this up here. Especially when we're considering this passage on um, um, doing not embittering them so that they don't become discouraged. Um, this is basically the things that you've already talked about. Um, some of the ways that we can embitter by ignoring them, indulging them, insulting them, intimidating them, um, comparing them to to a to a sibling. Uh, why can't you be more like so and so? Um, here here are some questions that uh, that um, he suggested in in light of a study of Colossians chapter three. Uh, Do I believe that my children are not mine, but rather a gift from God? Uh, entrusted to me? Am I partnering with God 
uh, to enable my children to become the men and women he intends them to be? Do they feel like I'm on their side? Um, I think that's a really good question. Am I living under the leadership of Jesus Christ in my life so that my children will have a model to follow? Uh, I can't remember which one of you brought up just a little while ago, the inconsistency uh, mm -hmm. thing. Um, am I calling my children to obedience and providing corrective guidance that's firm, but it's also fair? Um, so a couple of, of challenges. Um, mm -hmm. most, this one might not work uh, for you, but if the children are already gone, but um, what words or actions of mine make you the most angry? And um, asking our children to pray for us. Um, our children know that we pray for them, but um, asking our children to pray for us uh, can be a um, can be a powerful, powerful thing. Um, anything else you see on um, children and uh, father, children and parents, verses twenty and twenty one. Anything else you want to bring up? Uh, Dan, go ahead, brother. Mike, maybe it was just me, or maybe it's a normal process of growth and getting older. But as a teenager, you know, there became, there became a time when I felt like I knew more about what I needed and how I should <laughs> ask my parents. Oh, yeah. sure. mm -hmm. And then I got married and had children and figured out my dad was the smartest man I ever knew. Mm -hmm. yep. But, Amen. you know, there's a phase that you go through. Mm -hmm. in, gro in growing up where your parents even though they've done their very best aren't the voices that you're listening to for a while mm -hmm. but when they have done it right you will realize in the end that they were a whole lot smarter than you thought they were amen amen, amen. everybody on the screen experience that mm -hmm. yes yeah mm -hmm. Boy, it wasn't yes. just me go ahead tom i want, I want to add a layer of that but you go ahead first Tom. <laughs> when i was 18 years old turned 18 my dad said okay it's time for you to start making your own decisions and one night at dinner i used a curse word at dinner now you know, I was six foot five, three, 280 pounds at the time. My dad was a big man, 135 pounds, five foot eight. <laughs> he invited me out in the backyard and I got my last spanking when I was 18 years old. Oh, oh. oh boy. And, uh, I realized that making, making my own decisions, it, there was, there was a, a point, um, and I can make those decisions too. And it better not disrespect the home or, or my mom. Uh -huh. Absolutely, Tom. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, sir. Um, before we move on to the, um, the, um, the next section of this, um, uh, something Dan said, um, made me think of something that I hadn't planned on bringing up, but, but just to, to put it out there and, and for us always to have in mind, um, we, we've all experienced uh, that season um, when our children, um, we're not the first voice uh, that they're listening to um, for, for whatever reason, is just something about that particular stage in life. Um, that is, and, and anything we can do to drill this into the generation that's coming and, and the young families in our church, our own children, those are the seasons when it's so, so important uh, that our children have been around other adults that we feel comfortable that they would say what we would say, um, in, the, in certain situations. Um, I'll tell you very specifically that when, um, 
when Joshua was 15, 16, 17 years old, he, he was not rebellious by any stretch of the imagination. But I am I am grateful to this day that um, if there was an older person he needed to talk to, there were people like uh, Dan Nix in his life. If there were people one step mm-hmm. ahead of his life stage that he needed to talk to, there was a Chris Rozier in his life. If there was somebody uh, his parents' age that he needed some perspective from, other than his dad, Don Richards was there. And um, our ability to uh, make the kind of connections that can foster those relationships for the children as they come along, and for us to lean in and to be that for some of the children in our church uh, can, can be a spiritual lifesaver. Uh, so, um, you got that. You got that for free. Uh, but just uh, something to uh, think about uh, and uh, consider. All right. Um, verse twenty-two. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. Do it not only when their eye is on you to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, uh, not for human masters. Since you know that you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs as there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you also know that you have a master in heaven. Um. It's interesting for us that these verses are located in the middle of conversation about family relationships. It may look out of place on the surface to us, but in the days of Paul, um, most homes had, or especially in Colossae, more homes than not had slaves in them. And many of these slaves carried great family responsibilities. Now you're in a spot in the Colossian church where some Colossian believers are slaves, some are slave owners, but now they're brothers and sisters at the foot of the cross. So they have a brand new dynamic into their relationship. Um, Now, we're 2,000 years later. We are not in a culture where there's um, at slavery uh, to like what we read about here or slavery like what our country um, went through in its early years. But I do think there are some things here that um, can roll forward into our generation and, and, and speak to us in a very relevant and profound way. Um, I think, and um, you're feel free, feel free to disagree, but um, I think there is so much here that we can apply to um, where we are the majority of our time if we're still in the workforce, and that's our working relationships, the place where we're spending eight or more than eight hours uh, on a typical day for for many of us. Um, So so there's a lot here, I think, that can... um, that we can uh, tap into. Um, But let me ask you first, when we read these verses, um, what are some of the things that stick out in your mind? And then I'll tell you some things that stick out in mine. Well, first of all, Christ really transitions or transcends uh, all divisions of people. I think that's a, that's an excellent starting point, Tom, because in in Christ all of the relationships have a new, and that that that's parents and children. Parents and children have a uh, parents and children in the Lord have have a a different dynamic to their relationship. Uh, husbands and wives, with Christ at the center of their home, have a totally different dynamic than families that don't have Christ at the center of their home. And here we see it in other contexts. I appreciate you bringing that out. 
Richard, go ahead, brother. Certainly, I mean, I totally agree with Tom that the central theme is, is Christ at the center. However, uh, in these verses, too, you clearly pick up the undertones of the golden rule of treating others, you know, the way you would want to be treated. Uh -huh. and, and in addition, that uh, actions have consequences. I, th I think I think both are, are clearly seen here to um, uh, whichever whichever part of this relationship you're in to treat the other person the way you would want to be treated if you were in their shoes and also be aware of the consequences that are that are inevitable based on our actions uh, both both seen here for sure. So what's the responsibility, uh, if we were to roll this forward into um, um, co-worker relationships, uh, workplace relationships, um, what's the employee's job, what's the worker's job? What's their task? What made the boss. Yeah, Tom, go ahead. I think you, you, you bring out the, the understanding of, of we need to obey our bosses as long as it doesn't stray from the truth and what we are told to do as far as the Bible is concerned. We okay. are not to go ahead and use our jobs as an excuse to do things that are not what we are told to do as far as Jesus' as example and as far as what the Bible teaches. Okay, good. Okay. Let me share something I, I read um, a couple of days ago. A missionary was put in charge of supervising a group of natives on a work detail. He was frustrated because they only worked while he was watching over them. When he left, they would sit around and not do anything. So the missionary had a glass eye. So he decided he'd try something. He took his glass eye out, he sat it on a fence post, and he told the natives he'd be watching them even when he was away. It worked for a very short period of time, and then one day the missionary came back and he saw everybody sitting around again. He wondered what was up. He looked over to the fence post and he saw someone had put a hat over the eye. <laughs> <laughs> um, the way we used to say that is when the when the cat's away the mice will play mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, my mom was a uh, church secretary for many years and uh, one of the things that uh, that tickled her to no end was um, Conyers had a preacher for a relatively short period of time who's um, way of, of studying was to uh, to kind of pull his, his chair back from his desk and he would put his feet up on his desk and lean back and what she got a kick out of was was um, we had an elder named Joe Ware and uh, every time Joe Ware came by the office as soon as he heard that elder's voice his feet would almost fall onto the floor and he would lean up he would put his Bible on the desk and he would sit up straight. <laughs> <laughs> and then he walked in and, uh, and mama just thought that was, that was, and, and the elder didn't care how he studied. It was just the funniest thing, uh, to her, to her, to watch that, uh, happen. Um, but one of the, one of the things that challenges me in this passage is the end of verse 22 where uh, Paul says, um, he talks about working not only when their eyes on you, but when it's not. He says, do this with sincerity of heart and with reverence for the Lord. Right. And uh, one of the challenges for us is that Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? So, Determining our own sincerity of heart is not necessarily always the easiest thing uh, to do. Um, let me give you a very elementary example. 
let's say um, there's this random child, and uh, we'll we'll just say their name's Hannah. <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. Hannah comes home with a, um, and we look on um, hack. It's a home access computer thing, so we can see all of her grades. And we see that Hannah has made a uh, 71, 72 on a test. It's not a, not a disaster or anything, but it's certainly not her, her capabilities. So uh, we ask her about it, and she says, well, well, well Mom, well, Dad, I, I really tried my best on this. I, I really did everything I could. Now, we remember the day before that uh, she was on Roadblox, uh, which is a computer game. Uh, mm -hmm. She was on the TV. Uh, she was on everything except for the book of that particular class. Uh, we know that she was giving her best effort in that moment, but she didn't give her best effort leading up to that moment. Um, I said that to say this, one of the challenges in our lives is to check our motives and to check the sincerity of our hearts. Uh, because sometimes when we say we're all in, maybe we're all in in the moment, but maybe we weren't all in when we should have been all in. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Um, so, so I think Paul's got a good word for us here um, on that side of things. Um, and also for the, for the master in uh, verse one. Um, now, imagine how revolutionary it was in the first century in a, in a, um, in a largely Greco-Roman culture for Paul to say, masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair. Uh, some did that by their very nature. Many uh, did not. Um, yeah. Now, different ones of you have, have run your own business before, and you know that um, it's wise to treat your employees well to, for their own productivity, for their, for their ability to function well in the work environment. But, um, but Paul's giving us an admonition here uh, to be just and fair because that's what Jesus would do. So, so the motive has a little different, um, has a little different flavor to it. All right. What else do you see? Well, the best work environment is when there's no complaining or resentment from either side. Mm -hmm. I think so too, Tom. I think so too. That's the most productive. Yeah. Know who you're really working for. My boss is always a Jewish carpenter, right, Dan? Amen. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. Richard, what were you going to say? Equal respect. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Equal respect. Yeah, very good. You know, Mike, I, I grew up in a household with a <clears throat> Christian parents. And I never heard it, oh, by the way. And my, my parents, my dad, you know, if, if, if I got a C on a report card, you know, oh, by the way, if you'd have worked harder, you could have got a B. Yeah. Never heard that. All I heard was, did you do your best? Yeah, and that's, that's it. what. That's what became my standard is to, in order for me to answer my dad truthfully, I had to do my best. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, okay, everybody. Um, we're going to move forward next Wednesday night, pick up in verse two. We're going to spend two more weeks uh, in uh, Colossians. Uh, there, there's a lot to unpack just in verses two through six, believe it or not. So we're going to hang out there for a while next week, and then we'll spend our, our final night of Colossians in, in the greetings. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll move on uh, from there. Just to give you a, a um, long-distance uh, thought, 
Um, I am uh, kind of leaning right now toward us uh, starting a, a, a study after the first of the year called Smart Living. And we'll uh, look, at, look at some things in the book of Proverbs together. Uh, That'd be good. Not, not that you would be against Proverbs, but if you have something else that you're just dying to do, let me know. But um, and let, unless something comes up, I, I'm pretty well set. I think that's what we're going to do after the first of the year. I think there'll be... That'd be nice. I think we'll have a good time. Okay. Huh? Um, so thank you for being here. Uh, Jim Harkness, can I ask you to dismiss us in prayer, please, sir? Sure enough. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, we uh, thank you for this time that we can be together to uh, take the time to bring our petitions before you and our desires. And we pray that everything that... Uh, Mike had prayed for at the beginning of the class is within your will and that um, those responses and those answers will come back in a, in a positive way. We do pray that you uh, lead us in everything that we do, uh, especially as we talked about uh, as parents, as children, as co-workers, uh, whatever our position in life, whoever we're dealing with, uh, help us to do that with uh, equality, as Richard said, and we have the, the proper respect for one another, and especially for those that we love, that we're close to, and uh, help us to be that example that we should have in everything that we do. Father, we thank you for this message and the text that we were able to read, and thank you for this time where we can share with one another our thoughts and uh, ideas and uh, just, just the time of study and uh, sharing it together. We thank you for this evening, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate your efforts. Well done. Thank you, Tom. Good night. Good night. Good night. All right, good night, everybody. Love y'all. Good. good night. Everyone. Good night.